Hello everyone and welcome to Origami Outbreak, an event hosted by Imperial College and the Great Exhibition Road Festival's Explore at Home series. To celebrate World Origami Day, in this workshop we'll be using art to help demonstrate viruses, T-cells and antibodies. We'll be focusing on flu infection, the immunisation process and the immune system in general in this workshop. Uh, we're all very aware of the elephant in the room, um, a little thing called COVID-19, uh, but that's not what we'll be focusing on today. However, if we have some time at the end, um, then hopefully we can talk a little bit about that as well. But as I say, that won't be till the end. Um, my name's Scott and I'll be presenting today's workshop. And I'm joined today by experts in the worlds of both art and science. We have origami and paper artist, Tina Law, and we also have uh, respiratory scientists, Dr. Ryan Thwaites and Dr. James Harker. Hello to you all. Um, for this workshop, you will need um, uh, two pieces of A4 paper. Uh, maybe good to have a, fair, um, uh, a few spare as well on the side, just in case. Um, if you have some square paper, then fantastic, but not to worry because Tina will be telling us how to make square paper a little bit later on. And also you'll need a pair of scissors. Um, you can submit questions to Tina, Ryan and James at any time during the workshop via our YouTube chat. And we do, of course, advise everyone to be considerate uh, to others when they are writing their questions on the chat. And also you can post photos of your creations for us here and everyone at home to see. Uh, we'll post this information in the chat, so don't worry about remembering. Um, but I'll just say it now just in case. Um, if you have Twitter, then you can use the hashtag xrudfest, that's E-X-R-D-F-E-S-T. If you use that hashtag, then we'll be able to find your photos. Um, once again, that's E-X-R-D-F-E-S-T. However, if you don't have Twitter, then you can also send us an email and we'll put it on our Twitter. And of course, we'll give you credit. And that email you need to use is festival at imperial.ac.uk. Once again, that's festival at imperial.ac.uk. But as I said, no need to remember that. That will all be on the chat. So all you need to worry about is creating your origami art. So without further ado, it's time to introduce our artists and scientists. And we will start with Tina Law. Hello, Tina. Hi. Hi Hello. Uh, I'm very well. Uh, if you wouldn't mind telling us, Tina, a little bit about yourself and the work that you do. Um, so yes, I'm a paper artist. I'm also a model maker and um, I do a lot of um, just general paper art origami uh, for visual merchandising. I run a couple of workshops and uh, it's been really lovely being able to yeah, just uh, incorporate my art with something that uh, is something very tangible to the, the science world. Um, so it's been really fun actually organising all of this. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Now, I think we're all very excited to give this all a try. And uh, we'll move on to Ryan. Ryan, if you wouldn't mind telling us um, a little bit about yourself and the work that you do. Sure. Morning, everyone. Morning, Scott. Um, my name is Ryan. I'm a postdoctoral scientist at uh, Imperial College. And my work really focuses on how the body responds to respiratory viruses and how it learns to protect us from re-exposure to those kinds of viruses. Fantastic. And um, lastly, uh, we have uh, James. James, if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about yourself and the work that you do. Morning, Scott. Morning, everyone. Um, lovely to be here. Uh, so my name is James Harker. I'm a senior lecturer in the National Heart and Lung Institute. Um, and my lab focuses on understanding um, the mechanisms that regulate our immune systems and how in some individuals we get strong protective immune systems and in some individuals we get less protective immune systems and in particular we spend a lot of time focusing on why infants develop different immune systems to adults in response, response to respiratory infection. Fantastic. So there we have our three experts. Um, once again, remember that you can ask them questions at any time during the workshop. Um, and uh, just a little um, uh, uh, brief about what we'll be doing. We're going to make uh, three pieces of art using our paper and scissors. 
and they'll be to do with viruses and the immune system. Um, and also, as I said, uh, we really want to hear your questions. So if you pop them on the YouTube chat, they'll come to us here and we'll be able to ask our experts. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Tina, who's going to tell us how to prepare the paper. So Tina, if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. So you all should have um, gotten a couple of your resources. Uh, I've found some A4 paper uh, lying around, but ideally, thank you, ideally you want something a little bit more colourful. Um, so I've been kind of collating a load of different A4 coloured papers. Uh, you can also, like what Scott said earlier on, um, find yourself some square paper. Um, so what we want to do, if you do have A4 paper, we're going to just turn that into some square paper first. So um, I'm going to use one of this. So what you want to do is by corner, take the corner and you want to bring it to the line here. So if I just show you here. You go. You go. So uh, that's cool to if you've got lots of uh, different colour paper, indeed. Mm -hmm. I'm very boring. I've only got um, white paper here. All right. <laughs> You can always decorate it afterwards as well. That can be another craft in itself. So um, after you've got this, that's uh, you want to just cut along that line that's down here. You with your pair of scissors, just try and be as um, yeah close to the edge as you can without snipping the edge of the paper. Uh, so if you want to do that, great. So, uh, Tina, how long have you been um, involved with origami art for? Um, I've actually been doing it for most of my life. Um, it was I actually studied architecture um, in un university, but um, found that I really wanted to do something that was more creative and hands-on. And paper art was something that I've always had, um, yeah, just around me. Um, and I found my individual individuality for it. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. You never know, maybe in the future there'll be a need for um, origami in the world of architecture. Yes, <laughs> there are actually quite a lot of different um, origami of things within the architecture world and um, it's quite exciting. Um, but mm -hmm. I do I feel like there's something very um, accessible about paper and uh, it just doesn't scare me when I use it. <laughs> uh, I have actually a little fun gadget that's been lying on the side. Uh, so what I do when I'm trying to get really nice lines that are neat is, uh, I'll show you guys this, it just kind of glides down and cuts it for me. That's one of the best things I've ever seen. That is fantastic. <laughs> it is really great. Um, <laughs> it makes my life a lot easier when I'm cutting because I know it's a straight edge. Um, so yeah, these are, I think for the time being, we'll need around two of these. Keep the off cuts because um, we're going to use that for something in a bit as well. So yeah, just fantastic. the colours you want. I might cut out these red and yellow ones too, um, as we move into the next fold. Indeed, yes, and uh, I think uh, I think I speak for all of ev everyone watching on YouTube. They want to see that little machine work its magic again, <laughs> or yeah. work its science, I should say. Yeah, that is so fantastic. I, a funny thing is, I was I didn't buy this little mechanism. Um, I found it in my house that my parents um, my parents owned it. And um, one day I was just kind of creatively looking, figuring out what I can do with my origami work. And I picked this little cutter up and thought, yes, this would be my life, life changer for me. Yeah. Ever since then, it's been like the most important little <laughs> device that I have. Here you go. I can imagine. There it is. Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Ryan and James, are you uh, uh, making some square paper? I think I see. Got it there, fantastic. Very nice. <laughs> I think mine's a bit big. <laughs> so, uh, we're going to have big, big viruses. But <laughs> yeah. um, if you have the square paper already at hand, um, you can find something that it might be slightly smaller, but that's all right. Um, the ones that are like 
um, I guess standard size is around 15 centimeters by 15 centimeters. So if you can find that, that would be really good. Um, but yeah. Awesome. And with um, origami paper that you find there, is it um, thinner or thicker than like A4 paper using a print or Tina? Uh, it's slightly thinner. Um, mm -hmm. Origami paper has this tendency where it's just able to, uh, you want to be able to fold it as much as you can without it being too hard to fold. Because like with A4 paper, with your printer paper, mm. um, there is a a thick, a certain thickness that you can't fold the paper anymore. Whereas you're doing so many elaborate folds with origami that you do want to have it as as thin as it can go. Um, mm. so there we can... have. Yeah. Four square pieces of paper. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, if, if everyone's ready, we should move on to our first fold. Yeah, let's go ahead. Very good. So um, with um, our first fold, if um, uh, Tina, if you wouldn't mind telling us uh, what we're going to be making with our first fold. With our first fold, we'll be making a virus. Um, one of these here. So um, with having the two-sided coloured paper, you will get to see a little bit more of the, um, I guess, the spokes on your fold but it still looks really lovely on just your normal colored piece of paper. Um, I see what you mean. So the origami paper there has two sides and oh. we're able to see the spiral in the middle. Yes. Very good. Back today. And um, I suppose um, as you do um, your first fold there, Tina, I'm also just gonna ask uh, Ryan, uh, uh, quite a simple question, what is a virus? Sounds like a simple question, but it's it's almost not. Yeah. So viruses are, are very small um, kind of collections of proteins and nucleic acids, so genetic materials. Um, essentially, these are tiny kind of microscopic organisms that can't reproduce by themselves. So they need to uh, find a host, which is a host cell, uh, to be able to reproduce themselves. So they're kind of tiny microscopic, um, there's a debate whether they're alive or not alive. Um, you, most people would say that they're not alive because they can't reproduce by themselves. To get into a new host, find a target cell, which is a cell that can host its replication and go through a kind of life cycle to produce more copies of itself. So it's kind of a almost a self-replicating organism, but it needs to get into those host cells they able to do that okay no you're absolutely right as well ryan that it's <clears throat> not a simple question really i mean I, I have no idea myself um but it's it's, it's a short question um uh, i can see tina as well she's uh doing some folds there so we've got some diagonal folds and um some folds along um uh folding it in half as well um and uh, while we're carrying on there um just to ask Ryan as well, what um, what do viruses look like and is the shape of a virus important? Yeah, so the shape of viruses are really important for how they uh, manage to infect those target cells that I mentioned. So those cells that they need to get into to kind of go through that replication. So uh, every virus looks slightly different and um, some viruses are very small, some viruses are quite a lot larger, but they kind of have a common rough structure in the shape where um, there's these little, we call surface proteins on the outside of the virus. And those are really important for the virus binding onto a target cell. So mm -hmm. in the fold that we're doing today, um, on the left of Tina's screen, you can see the little bits poking out of the top of the virus. Those bits, yep. So we've chosen this fold because they kind of represent those surface proteins on the outside of a virus, which coat the virus, and are used to latch on to target cells to kind of to start that entry and start that replication cycle. So um, that's why the surface and structure of the virus is really important. And that's why we, we've picked this fold for viruses particularly as well. Okay. And would different viruses have, um, I'm guessing, different uh, shapes and different... Um, yeah, outside. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. So different viruses um, have different 
those different surface proteins. And each of those different surface proteins uh, leads to a different way of the virus getting into cells, but they all kind of have a common root, really, of having those proteins on the surface that they use to bind onto a target cell. They just change and they're different between different kinds of viruses. Okay. And we can see here that team is it's kind of the kite shape I can see there. Yeah. So we're creating the inner, inner side of it right now. And you'd want to make something like this. Uh, it's really important to keep this part, the open part at the top. The instructions should stay as well um, for you to create this. And you want to do that to all of the sides. Just go ahead. Um, okay, yes, as Tina mentioned, there was um, a sheet that hopefully everyone has as well, which is a kind of a step by step guide. Um, but hopefully now seeing Tina do it on screen will help tremendously as well. Um, also, um, more questions about virus. Um, what specifically are the bits and bobs? I'm sure that's a scientific term, bits and bobs that make up a virus, like what's inside one? So I've spoken about those those surface proteins, which look mm -hmm. like the, the little um, spokes or spikes on the, the fold that we're doing today. Within the virus, so there's those kind of surface proteins on the outside, and then the inside is quite commonly in a, a kind of sphere shape. Within there is the genetic material that the virus has. So like us, viruses have genetic material which... Uh, kind of tell the, or tell the host cell how to produce new copies of virus. And that that genetic material has to get inside of a cell to start the, the cycle of making new viruses. So another thing that we quite like about this fold that represents the virus is that um, you can kind of open up the fold from the outside by pulling on the little spokes. And that... Um, is quite similar to the way that a virus grabs onto a target cell and then pushes its genetic material from the inside of the virus into the target cell. And that's an important part of the virus then invading that cell to be able to start making new copies of itself. So it's another reason that we picked this, this fold. Oh, fantastic. Um, just um, uh, say, that, Tina, we've got a few um, comments from the audience. If uh, we could uh, just slow down a tiny bit yeah. with um, the process here. But as we can see, uh, Tina is now cutting the top of the kite. <laughs> mm -hmm. Term I've coined there, but that looks all good. So um, what's the next um, step after this, Tina? You want to open it up completely. Fantastic. And we've got a nice octagon shape there. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the base that we'll be working from. Brilliant. Um, we've, um, I can see we've got some questions coming in from our audience as well. Um, I've got actually a question from Sarah, and she sent her question in um, before the event today. And her question is, how does a virus spread so quickly across the world? Well, I think it's um, almost the... A unique feature, really, of the kind of world that we live in now, where um, global travel is so common uh, and so easy and available to so many people, that um, if a new strain of virus, and we're particularly talking about influenza today, if a new strain of influenza emerges, then it can quite quickly um, infect a number of people. And some of those people are likely to go on flights or take trains across country. Um, and in that way, the virus really spreads with the people away from the point where it first comes. So viruses need hosts to, to kind of carry the virus. So you need to have infected people. Viruses don't live very long by themselves. But uh, if you've got people and if you've got people moving around, then the virus is going to spread with those people. Um, and really, as we've kind of seen in the last few months, you need to prevent a lot of movement in order to really stop viruses spreading. So um, really, the virus is spread with them. Okay. And we can see here that, um, just recapping what Tina's doing here, we've made an um, octagon shape and then we're folding each of those sides down. Uh, and would you say, Tina, with this um, uh, creation, this piece of origami art, um, it's a lot of kind of doing one step and repeating it over again? Eight yeah. times, I'm guessing. <laughs> yes, it's a lot of repetitive 
unfolding. Um, but it's quite therapeutic just when you get the hang of it. Um, Fantastic. Um, I'm just going to go to our first live question, which we got in the YouTube chat. Uh, this is a question from Jack, and he asks, what is a target cell? Yeah, sure. So I, I think I probably spoke a little bit too quickly about the target cell bit. So um, if we're talking about influenza today, then um, influenza can infect some types of cells around the body. And those cells are called target cells, those cells that can kind of host the influenza virus. Um, for influenza, that's really some cells that line the respiratory tract. So in the upper airway, in the nose, and through down the kind of trachea and into the lung. So those tissues in those bits of your body have certain kinds of cells that, for example, influenza virus can get into. And those cell types are called target cells. Now, they are slightly different for different respiratory viruses often, um, but for respiratory viruses, they're localized to that respiratory tract. So for example, uh, cells in your skin couldn't be target cells. And that's usually because they don't express the right kind of receptors. So those um, surface protein and the virus that I talked about mm -hmm. recognize other cells other than the target cells in the respiratory tract for influenza. Okay. Um, we're just seeing here as well, uh, Dean's moving on to, uh, she's done the other fold eight times, turned it around, and now we're moving on to this fold here. Um, and also just a reminder to everyone at home uh, watching on YouTube, you can also rewind the video at any time if you need to look at um, a step one more time. We can see here. So, uh, Tina, what's, um, just a little recap about what um, we've done so far with this yeah. fold. So, if we recap, like what you said, we've just folded it over, flipped it over, and um, you want to find these two corners of your face and fold it to the middle, like so. Fantastic, and that's very clear here from my screen. So we're folding it to the middle. Um, we have another question as well from the YouTube chat. This is from Maisie, and uh, she asks, what is the most deadliest virus? Wow, um, yeah. <laughs> that's a good question. Um, good question for the early afternoon. <laughs> yeah, it's a very big question, actually. I mean. We're talking about respiratory viruses, um, and some of the the, um, the first SARS virus. So that's not the virus that's causing COVID nineteen at the moment, but one that um, arose in about two thousand and three. Um, really, very deadly. So that um, kills. We need to look it up, but it, in excess of fifty percent of the people that were infected, I think, right. which is really very very high far higher than respiratory viruses that we have year in, year out, like influenza, and much higher as well than the virus that causes COVID-19. Uh, other viruses, um, things like HIV, is a virus that causes AIDS, um, if it's not treated, can also have a very high mortality rate. So, um, but with good treatments, um, these things are, are largely curable. So. Different viruses have very, very different um, severities and how much symptoms they cause and how much um, the kind of mortality rate is associated with them. Okay, um, no, thank you for, very much for answering that. Um, I'm just going to go back here to Tina. Um, Tina, if you wouldn't mind showing us uh, one of these folds that you're doing here um, so the audience can see clearly that, um, again, I'm guessing this is one of those eight-step eight, eight step folds. <laughs> Yes, it is. So I'm repeating this at the moment. There's a point here and a point here from your score line that you want to create a crease. So it'll be here. So if I just show an example of that again, you want to crease it down that line, like so. There you go. There's a crease there. And Fantastic. then you want to rotate it and with this corner where there's one of your little flaps that you folded earlier on, you can see there, with that corner, you want to fold it to this line. So it's always folding it to towards the middle. 
and then a case of repeating that over and over again. <laughs> um, I always have a question for um, opening this up to uh, Ryan and James, um, asking what's happening inside of our lungs, um, specifically when a flu virus attacks? So I, I can take that if you want, Scott. Yes. Um, I mean, I think, you know, the very first phases of a flu infection are actually uh, very innocuous. The virus um, will enter the cells often of the kind of our nasal cells, the cells that line our nasal cavity. Um, it will, very few cells will actually get infected during an initial infection. Um, and for a few days, that virus will replicate inside some of those cells burst out of those cells and infect neighboring cells. And eventually what happens is sufficient of the virus um, starts to appear in our, in our respiratory tract that our immune system is alerted mm -hmm. that there is a potential threat. So what tends to happen is our immune response starts to kick in. And while this workshop is focused on the, the responses we're looking for out of vaccines, the first symptoms people tend to experience when they get a flu infection are actually associated with our innate immune responses, our kind of programmed immune responses, attempts to clear infection. So our mucus becomes thicker so that the viruses are removed from the cells as fast as possible. Um, a lot of the cells in the upper respiratory tracts will be killed off, to prevent the virus from being able to replicate, um, and will also cause some cells to infiltrate into that area so they'll move into the site of the infection to try and kill the virally infected cells so you might get some um, fever associated with that maybe some nasal congestion associated with the increased kind of fluid content around your nose so those are the kind of early phases of a viral infection and our symptoms are often a mix of both the virus and also our own response to the to the virus it's just about to add although it might be uncomfortable having all that mucus around your nose it's actually a good sign because it shows that your body is working and doing its job properly absolutely perfectly mm -hmm. normal part of the uh, um, response fantastic so, and i see here as well tina i think we're coming to uh, close to the end of um, these current folds here mm -hmm. so if you wouldn't mind just um, telling us what's um, going to happen now with the creation so as you've been watching, I've been pulling out previous folds to help us finish off the rest of these folds that we've been making. So as we come to the end, I'm just doing the last one now. Um, as I'm doing the last one here, what we want to do is we're trying to tuck everything into each other. So you have this one that we've made from previously and we want to then tuck in this whilst keeping the base the same crease and just push that in like so push that so the crease lines that you've made should have helped you at this point to just help these folds come in. And there you go. And there we have a virus. Fantastic. Yes. And uh, uh, James and Ryan, would um, the virus that we see here, does that uh, remind you specifically of any uh, viruses that you've come across? Well, I mean, I think it's a it's a highly structured virus with clear, distinct outer elements. And that's that's reflective of a lot of respiratory viruses. Obviously, the virus we're doing in today's workshop um, influenza A virus um, that has um, distinct surface molecules on its outer outside that uses to it uses to bind our cells in the respiratory tract. Probably one that people might have heard of is hemagglutinin, um, or they at least might have heard that we refer to viruses or people refer to viruses as H1N1 or H5N1, and that refers to that spike on the outside of the virus, that H, and obviously in today's era, also coronaviruses. So SARS coronavirus two has spike proteins. They're literally called spike proteins mm -hmm. um, that create the crown like structure 
that we see when we look at really high magnification at a, at a virus. Fantastic. And we can see that the team was opening it up and down as well, showing how malleable it can be. Very good. I, um, I believe it's now time to uh, move on to our next fold. And just a reminder, everyone, um, that we'd love to hear your questions. So uh, please send them via the YouTube chat. And of course, send us uh, photos of your creations as well. And you can do that via our Twitter. And hopefully you'll see the information either on screen or on the chat as well. But um, Tina, if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about um, the next creation. And also, uh, this is my fault, but we've had um, some people asking about explaining each step. So feel free to interrupt um, us at any time to explain each step of the creation as well with this one. Sounds good. Um, if there's anything uh, that you don't understand from the pre previous fold, you can always rewind and look into the instructions as well. Um, but if there's, yeah, anyone that's struggling with doing that last fold, I can also um, just show how to do that again at one point. Fantastic. Thank you for that, Tina. So the next fold you'll be doing is the T-cell fold. Um, this one, I'll like to start with a new sheet of paper that we prepared earlier. And um, what you want to do, like in the previous fold, do diagonal crease. Like this for us in the middle. We want to flip that over again. And then like the other one, you want to fold down the middle here. And here we're making a T cell, isn't that right, um, Tina? Yes. Fantastic. And um, Ryan, Ryan and James, um, I'll put this to you. Uh, what is a T cell? So I'll start off. So um, we've talked about the virus and it's binding onto cells. So that's kind of all of the part of what the virus does. But of course, your body is trying to respond to that virus all the time. And the cell type that we're talking about here, the T cell, is a type of immune cell that um, circulates around the body and hunt down infected cells. So these cells, these T cells, look for these target cells that have been infected by a virus and try and destroy those cells basically to try and stop the virus being able to get out and stop that bit of its replication. So cells are or one kind of T cell are this kind of hunter killer or detective kind of cell that patrol the body, look for infected target cells and try and stop them producing virus. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Ryan. And we can see here that Tina's showing uh, this shape here. It kind of, the folds looked a little to me like a Union Jack flag. And then we folded it into this shape. Yeah. So and what's the, the next step up? Yeah. Bottom has to be the open side. Just keep that in consideration while you're doing the next fold. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to take the flap, the first top layer, and make a slight crease into the middle. So you want it to reach corner to corner and only fold this middle here as a guideline. Open that back up. And we're going to fold these two corners into the middle that you've just created, the little cross here. So you want to, the whole flap, fold that inwards like this and you do that to the other side as well yeah and um we just got a quick question here um from chicken nuggets good friend of mine chicken nuggets um if viruses don't have mitochondria where do they get their energy from to move around and inject their genetic material into target cells thank you very much for that question chicken nuggets that's, that's a really interesting question. So I don't know about Ryan's thoughts on this, but um, in actual fact, um, viruses, unless they're inside cells, are fairly inert um, particles. So they just move around in respiratory tract in response to the airflow that's carrying them around into our lungs in droplets. Um, and then they just get randomly deposited on the mucosal surfaces of our respiratory tract. Um, 
the energy that allows them to inject the material is actually provided by our own cells. So we ourselves normally uptake particles and molecules from the outside environment and viruses have effectively adapted to take advantage of that uptake. So mm -hmm. they stick to the surface of our cells and, and we help them, we bring them in so that it just like actually most of the other ways in which viruses manufacture things, they hijack our own machinery um, in order to replicate and spread. Okay, wow. <laughs> we can see here as well that um, uh, Tina's folded that down. Again, I don't know the technical terms uh, for these, Tina, but that looks like an envelope to me <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> it is very much like an envelope. So you just created, just folded all the corners into the middle. You want this, this fold that we just made really creased, just, so just deeply creased that. And once you've done with that, you want to open the whole sheet up. So what we've been doing is we've been creating guidelines for us to make the fold itself. Um, so here are your guidelines when you open it up. And I want us to just fold down this line so that it's all one val a valley fold. So a valley fold means that it's going down the way like this. That's a valley fold. And then a mountain fold is actually that way. So it's just a folded, it's an inverted version of a mountain a valley fold. So just do that with all these lines going around, which is creating the square. Fantastic. And while um, Tina's making those valley folds, I'm going to ask um, our scientists about um, other types of cells that we have. So we talked about T cells, but could you talk a little bit about B cells as well and what sure. they are? Mm. So, yeah, I'm, ha I'm, uh, I'm happy to talk about B cells. So as, as Ryan said, T cells are part of our immune response that hunt down infected cells and they, they kind of go uh, face to face with the infected cells and they kill them on a kind of one to one basis. So very specific. Um, um, and in some ways incredibly elegant. B cells, on the other hand, are effectively what we consider the other half of our adaptive immune system. So that's the immune system that allows us to specifically and respond and remember what infections and vaccines we've seen. And B cells are kind of more remote killers. So their job is in response to an infection to learn what the outer proteins of that particular infection look like and secrete molecules, which are called antibodies, into our circulation and into our various bodily fluids that will actually flow around our bodies, um, bind any particular infectious particle. So in this case, a uh, flu virus, they'll bind the outside of that flu virus and they'll prevent that flu virus from infecting other cells. They'll attract um, immune cells to those infectious particles and have them cleared from the immune system. So B cells are kind of, remote killers. So often antibodies that they produce are called the magic bullets of the immune system because they can track down and kill um, viruses at a, a very long range. So they often, B cells aren't often seen in the site of infection itself, but often removed from the site of infection. Okay. And we can see here now, um, yes, Tina, away. Um, we can see that we're folding um, uh, where Tina's We've got the square in the middle. Absolutely. So only fold those lines. And to help you with that, um, you want to bring the edge to this point that you've got created here. You don't want to fold the whole line down, just the square. Just folding uh, where that square was. And um, Tina, a question for you. Do you find, so of course with this um, workshop, um, we're talking about viruses and the immune system. But have there been other pieces of work you've done in the past or things you might plan in the future where um, you'll use uh, science as a stimulus, like we've used viruses today? So uh, a lot of my work actually have influence with nature. And uh, I think a lot of the things that nature has in its fundamental element is connected to what the science of it is and um yeah i'll definitely naturally naturally probably find a curiosity to want to do more um creations in in that field um and i think with origami a lot of it is ge geometry and mm. 
it comes um, with an understanding of just different different ways that the paper looks nice in a certain way when it falls under this realm of geometry. Um, there must uh, I'm sure people have heard of the golden ratio, um, and that's all kind of linked into elements of science as well. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah, something I'm very interested in too. Our, our good friend Fibonacci and his sequence. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Fantastic. And what's the next step that we're doing here? So after we've done this square, we want to, I'm going to just draw out the lines that we're going to fold next. So we're going to be folding this point in the square to this line, this point in mm -hmm. that line on the outer corner. So these are the two lines that we'll be creating next. This is a little bit tricky because you're kind of guessing, similar to the previous step, you're kind of guessing where this line falls. Um, so a lot of the times I actually do like having the pen with me to help me guide where this fold line is supposed to be. So you want to try to pivot it onto this point as best as you can with your finger and just fold it down this crease. Mm -hmm. And then once you've done that, you want to fold this, this fold down and repeat it on the other side, which is that line I've that just created there. Okay. So hopefully that's clear to um, our audience. And um, if not, remember you can rewind at any time to have a look at fold um, again. And um, also, we're just going to ask, because um, I've just um, seen here that we need to adjust the screen slightly. But uh, while we do that, I'm going to ask a question to James and Ryan and ask, um, how does a vaccine work? Um, I, I can take this question, Ryan, then you can take the next one. I think that would be. Um, so I think the way in which vaccines work is that researchers try and identify those parts of a virus that they're trying to stop um, that can be used by our immune systems to kill and clear the infection and they take only those parts and they leave behind all the pathogenic or pathological parts of the virus they take only those parts and depending on the type of vaccine they add um, an agent that will drive an immune system so we might just take the proteins we might just take the spikes say on the top of that flu virus and we might inject that into the body on its own and see if we can persuade the immune system to see those surface proteins and generate an antibody response against it say to prevent those proteins from interacting with the host okay so if we can create those those antibodies against those proteins we can stop the virus even entering our cells by creating a protective barrier other vaccines and, and a lot of how we develop different vaccines was by taking those same proteins the same molecules and just seeing in what way we can elicit an immune response from our body so people will have seen rna based vaccines where we create a, an rna molecule based map of those proteins other people use other viruses such as um, adenoviruses um, and they place which are not particularly pathogenic on their own so we can place proteins from other pathogens other infectious diseases in there and we can use those um, as a way of letting our immune system see the infectious proteins. Does Fantastic, that thank you. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, I'm just seeing here as well, Tina's, um, the fold that she was making before, she's done it for each of the corners here. And um, I think we might be ready for our next step. Oh, uh, Tina, I think um, you're, um, you might be muted. Oh, there we go. Sorry, so the next step, we want these corners to be folded down here. So you've got this little flap. You want the corner of the flap to be tilted onto the right. And then what we're going to do is we're going to fold this corner so it meets this edge here. So you can see that black line that I've drawn here. You want that corner to meet that there, like so. You can see that tucks in the flap, and after you've done that, you want to flip the whole flap 
over to itself onto the other side and then you want to again tuck this corner in so it meets this edge here i will repeat that with the other corners so you guys can see it's a little bit tricky because you're doing the inside part right now we're making the point so mm -hmm. it will be a little bit tricky inside this corner but i'll go because it Definitely for me, if, if, I, if I was making this, it would um, I, I, I'd have messed it up um, about uh, 20 folds ago, knowing me. But um, we do uh, have a question from Samin, who does ask a question for you, Tina, about what has been the most complicated origami um, creation you've ever made? Uh, so the sort of origami work that I do is called 3D modular origami. And mm -hmm. I created so it's kind of like lego blocks but instead with paper um and they kind of slot together and the creation that i created was uh, that i made was for um was around two meters long and it was a little um it was just for a gallery just to show um a conceptual idea of what movement looked like to me and um, that was a really exciting origami um kind of create a challenge for myself um doing mm. something at that scale i'm not used to doing anything um that big because this is yeah <laughs> I, like, I like doing things at this scale uh, but yeah there's other different things as well um that i've done with um that's not actually origami it's still under the world of paper art and um it's basically creating flat packs like flat pack models and then you fold it from 2D into a 3D model. Um, and I've created a couple buildings. And one of my favorite buildings that I've made is an Osaka castle. Um, so it was very elaborate and detailed, very exciting stuff. OK. Yeah, no, it's, that's interesting. What, what, what uh, differentiates uh, paper art to something that's specifically origami? Paper art is a lot more to do with designing um, something that could be cut out. Whereas origami, mm -hmm. you specifically look at it as a um, one sheet element or something that's a lot more um, kind of uh, focused on the folding aspect of it. So with paper art, it's a lot more to do with score lines and cut lines to create different, um, yeah, different kind of uh, depths. Whereas with origami, you're folding everything into each other to make different shapes and size shapes and different um yeah just different things and function forms as well i see so what you mean done with, um, the inside uh and what we want to do now is we're going to switch the um perspective of it to be um the outside here so we're on the last step now um hopefully you guys have been able to catch up well um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take these two corners and meet them into the middle, like so, and you'll create a little flap here. With this flap, you want to tuck it into this, oh, sorry, uh, this little gap in here. So what we did in our previous step is actually really important to create this gap. So um, be careful. Be wary of what side you've folded that inner corner here. So I'm going to do that with the other side so you guys can see me um, just finish this off. So corner to corner. Like so with this flat, you want to tuck it in to this slight gap here. It's a bit tricky just because paper paper <laughs> uh, <laughs> because of paper <laughs> sometimes so a lot of my work a lot um sometimes the paper kind of dictates what it wants to do like i you can't really kind of wants to fight back at you um but right. i think that's also one of the reasons why i really like using origami um so you want to do that tuck that in because I suppose every creation that you make, it might be the same design, but everything is ever so slightly different every time yeah, you make it. Mm. Absolutely. And here you go. We've created our tea cell. 
Fantastic. And is the uh, uh, Ryan and James is the shape of a T cell important as well, uh, well in the way that they work? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we've kind of picked this fold because it's um, a bit of a kind of asymmetric shape. So we might think of cells normally as being kind of spherical or square shaped or something. But commonly when they become activated, they might hunker down onto a cell or something else to kind of perform their function. So in the T cell that Tina's made, it's got a kind of flatter side and then a kind of diamond shaped pointy bit. We might think that that flatter end is the bit that has attached onto an infected cell and it's going to try and kill that infected cell through that flattened end. So it's kind of grabbed onto an infected cell and it's trying to um, get rid of that infected cell in that way. Brilliant. Um, thank you for answering those questions. Um, as we move on to our final fold of the workshop, just a reminder to everyone that you can submit your questions on YouTube chat and also send in your pictures. I believe we have um, one or two already, which we'll show at the end of the workshop. Um, but right now we're going to move on to fold three. So Tina, do you mind introducing this one? Yes. So the next last fold that we're going to make is a antibody. Um, we'll be wanting to use the scraps that we used um, previously. I'm going to use one of the yellow ones um, and we're just going to fold it so we can create, so it's uh, kind of like a rectangle, so you just want to fold it in half and half again and into just a smaller rectangle like so. This might be a little thick for the paper, so what you can also do is you can half the size of the paper. I might do that, actually. I'm going to oh. use my little clients here. Again, love it. There it is. <laughs> as um, I'm sorry to interrupt, Tina, but as um, you're, you're making those uh, rectangle folds, just going to quickly ask Ryan and James uh, what an antibody is. So, I mean, that's a really, really great question, Scott. Um, Thank you. <laughs> antibodies are um, these molecules that B cells secrete in response to infections and vaccines. Um, and they're small molecules. Um, and they're often described as being Y shaped. So, what they, they have is at the end of these molecules are two little spaces, sites that can specifically bind um, a particular molecule. In our case, we would care about whether or not those those antibodies can bind um, a virus. So if they can bind flu virus. And at the mm -hmm. other end, they basically have um, a structure, a molecular signal that flags any nearby immune cells or um, that there's a, a threat. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of binding to a virus and at the other, other end of their molecular structure, they'll have like a, a red flag kind of thing going, look at me, you need to come over here and clear up this infectious mess going on. this mess <laughs> uh, you know and and that's that's and so while tina's folding that what you'll see is the shape we've picked references those two elements so the two binding sites at one end um which means also the antibodies can bind multiple infectious agents so they can bind two different viruses two viral particles at the same time for instance um and then at the other end the kind of sturdy base that keeps them stable in our bodies and flags up threats to the immune system. Fantastic, and as we can see there, and have we uh, finished there with that creation, Tina? Yes, I've actually made the paper even smaller, so you can actually make another antibody um, in this time as we ask more questions. So that's oh, br Brilliant, one. yes, uh, that, that'd be great. Thank you for that, Tina. Um, we do have a question here from, uh, uh, where we have, sorry, just having a look on the site here, um, from Katinka. And she asks, how do viruses cause inflammation in the lungs? Sure. So um, I guess there's kind of two ways you might think that a virus and a, an infection causes inflammation. Um, the first bit of that is that we mentioned viruses kind of getting into those target cells and creating new copies of, those, of the virus itself within that target cell. Now, in order to get the virus out of the target cell, um, the virus basically blows up the cell, so that pours all of the virus out of the inside of that target cell. So that kind of response would start to cause uh, inflammation because of cells being killed by the virus by the virus itself. Hmm. 
the other way um, is that the body has to respond to this virus and so the kind of damage that it's causing. And in order to do that, um, it sends cells like T cells into the, uh, into the lung or into the site of infection to start clearing up those infected cells. And that response itself also causes some damage and kills some other cells and causes inflammation. So kind of the virus does some, especially in the early stage of an infection. And later on, the immune response causes some inflammation as well to kind of get rid of the virus. Brilliant. Well, thank you for that. No, um, I like to the use of like explosion there about the, uh, uh, <laughs> that is quite gruesome, but uh, that's that's a lot of viruses in the immune system and antibodies. Um, and we can uh, see here that Tina's made uh, three of the antibodies there. And um, if you do have um, any photos, you want to quickly get in the last few minutes of the workshop of your creations, we'd love to um, see them. All the information should be on the chat. Um, I do believe that we have some photos from earlier, which have come up on our Twitter. Um, if you wouldn't mind, um, hopefully we'll be able to see that on the screen very shortly, um, these creations. There we go. So. Um, we're just going here. So Steve has been making them. Um, if we mind, uh, we can see that there we go. And we've got a nice T cell there. And our lovely faces and in the background. They look beautiful. Amazing. Very well done. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Nice one, guys. That is fantastic. It's odd. I, I think I speak for all of us here on the... Uh, uh, on our little Zoom here that um, uh, we have us for are chatting and uh, sometimes you feel like you're in a void, but it's good to see that there are people out there uh, watching and listening and making their creations. So they were fantastic. If there's any more in the last couple of minutes you want to send in, but it gives us a, a bit of time to ask some more questions uh, from our audience. So uh, um, we have um, a question from Nasheen who asks, um, what is um, a vaccine? Have we talked about that before? Correct me. I think uh, the question, what is in a vaccine? What is in a vaccine? You're absolutely <laughs> right. I can't read. Sorry, Nasheen and everyone. So what is yeah, inside a vaccine? And are there different types of vaccines? So, I mean, there absolutely are in uh, different types of vaccines. And what is in a vaccine will depend on the type of vaccine you're talking about. So it's an incredibly complex question, probably deserving its own workshop on its own. Mm. Um, the bit we've talked about before is that they always contain um, a part of the infection you're trying to stop mm -hmm. that the immune system can recognize. So in the case of flu, they're always going to contain a protein called hemagglutinin, which sits on the outside of the virus and that our antibodies can recognize to stop the virus entering our cells. Uh, the bit that varies is how the vaccinologists um, formulate that protein to elicit immune response to our um, elicit our immune response. So um, flu vaccines quite often are either killed flu viruses or inactivated, attenuated flu viruses. So they'll be the flu virus, but it won't be able to replicate in our bodies. And that's enough of a stimulation to get our bodies to go, OK, we need to make some antibody against this flu virus. Mm -hmm. um, other vaccines will be made up of just those proteins with a small molecule, maybe a chemical that will induce an immune response, an inflammation, inflammatory response. Um, so different vaccines are made up of different um, constituents. And for instance, with coronavirus, there are at least 10 different types of vaccine being developed for that purpose with different things in them, but all with the spike protein of coronavirus inside them. There we go. And there's there's that word, that elephant, elephant in the room there. But um, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> which we got in just at the end. Um, and also um, a quick question I'm going to ask. This is from Maisie. Um, what do you have to study at uni to become a, a, a virologist? And then also um, we talked about it right at the beginning, Tina, about how you studied architecture. But is there any other ways you can learn origami? So that's uh, a broad question to all three of you about uh, what you have to uh, do at school in order to do what you do today. <laughs> Should I start? Well, start on half of James and I, maybe, just for time. So um, uh, I studied biochemistry at university, um, and that kind of I fell into that because my chemistry teacher suggested it, really. Mm -hmm. That was the honest answer. 
Um, <laughs> and from there, kind of developed an interest in how the immune response works. And that's where kind of my career started from. Fantastic. And the same to James? Uh, so almost exactly the same pattern. So I, I also <laughs> chemistry at uni. Um, but I think any biochemistry, biomedical science, biology, you'll find if you go to any of those scientific disciplines, um, there's an opportunity to learn about our bodies, the molecules in our bodies, and should you become interested in viruses, viruses. Um, <laughs> and then you can do masters and PhDs like me and Ryan that progressively specialize you deeper and deeper down the rabbit hole. <laughs> Indeed. And um, uh, Tina, as we said, you studied architecture at uni, but is there anything else that um, others here can uh, do to learn origami and things that you do now? In paper? Um, like what James was saying, I think it takes interest and that is the key element to drive you to do what you want to do. And with me, I, I really put creativity as my priority. And so I really pushed for doing what I wanted to do with paper art so um just work on a portfolio really push through and really value the work that you have and i think your degree will definitely give you a good um kind of foundation of what you can um how to improve in your work and your career as well Oh, brilliant. And there we just see Maisie's thanking all three of you there for those uh, creations that you've made. And I want to uh, thank everyone watching at home. We're running slightly over, but we just have time at the end now for um, asking uh, a little bit of a wrap up. So uh, before we wrap up today's workshop, I'm going to hand over to Tina, Ryan and James and ask if they have anything that they'd like to plug or give a shout out to. Should, shall we start with uh, Tina? Anything you'd like to plug or give a shout out to? Uh, yes, if you can just yeah check out my work on instagram my website um my name hand handle is storigami so story and then it's i g a m i um i have a lot of my paper artwork and just like things that i'm working on generally um on instagram as well if you want to check it out brilliant and i'm sure we'll pop that information as well on our chat and uh ryan is anything uh, you want to plug leave a shout out to I think I'd probably just like to say thanks to all of the team behind the scenes that kind of work out these things and do all the logistics and things for us. Um, and for the team as well that first put us in touch with Tina probably about a year ago um, when we started doing origami <laughs> workshops that, you know, it's been a, an ongoing thing and it's, great to, it's a great way of talking about our work. So thanks to all of those people. Fantastic. And uh, finally, we move on to um, James. So from my perspective, um, the same as Ryan, thank you to all of you guys for putting together a really great workshop and especially Tina for developing the artwork. I think I'd also like to plug the British Society for Immunology. Um, most of you hopefully have got the instructions with the link. They help pay for some of this workshop's development, but also they have great information on vaccines and viruses that you can find out about on their website. So if you want more detailed information, go there. There's there's information at every level. Um, so, so please enjoy that. And also do come and see us whenever we are able to hold a physical Great Exhibition Road Festival and do this workshop in person, because we'd love to see you. Indeed, yes, I, um, I've i worked one before. I work next door to Imperial at the Science Museum normally, and uh, I've been to, um, I, I was working at one, Not was it last year or the year before? And it was fantastic, so I definitely Re definitely recommend going uh, once uh, we can go outside again. But we've had lots of comments now coming through about um, uh, saying thank you to all three of you. So indeed, thank you all very much. Um, a recording of this workshop will appear on the Great Exhibition Road YouTube channel after we finish today. And make sure to send those pictures in again to our Twitter and that hashtag and to that email address, which is on the YouTube chat. Uh, please do follow us on YouTube and our various social media channels um, if you like these events and you'll get a notification when we do future ones. Um, also on the chat now you will find that a link to a form where you can tell us your thoughts about the event and we'd very much appreciate um, getting those um, so we can uh, work on them and improve them for future ones and a link to upcoming events as well. So um, to finish things off on behalf of myself, Imperial College and the Great Exhibition Road Festival, I'd like to thank Tina, Ryan, James and yourselves as well for making these creations at home. Uh, take care everyone, and I hope you have a great rest of the afternoon. Goodbye.